Hello friends, I thought we could start this week's reading vlog on a Friday. I don't know when this will be posted because I kind of miss posting them on Friday, but anyways, it's April 1st, the first day of a new month. I love that fresh feeling of a new month and a fresh start with reading. And I am in the middle of one book right now, but I've been spending a ton of time filming this morning. My throat is quite tired by now, actually. I have gotten sick again. Um, it's not bad, but I, my nephew had a little cold and then I think my mom got it and then I've just been so run down. I knew this was going to happen, but I also got fresh hair for a fresh new month. It is lighter. Strawberry blonde is the goal to get to one day when my hair is healthy enough. So little by little, we'll get there. Um, okay, so I'm going to, I'm watching these little bunnies. <laughs> Oh my God, they're so cute out in my backyard. I love them. And they're just like chasing each other. Why are they so precious? Oh, Paul is getting his wisdom teeth out this morning. So I'm a worrier, so I'm trying not to worry about him. I mean, it's routine, I'm a dental hygienist, it'll go fine. But he's gonna come over today or tomorrow so I can help take care of him. The kitties are just being something else today. Squish them, squish them, squish them. And um, <laughs> so I'm gonna go to the gym here soon. I need to clean the whole house and I need to somehow film another video, but it's not good when the videos that I need to film in the same day end up being a monthly wrap up and then quarter one statistics. I'm still watching the adorable little bunnies um, because it is way too much talking because my wrap up was an hour of filming and then I had to work on some other filming things too. So I don't know if I'll get that filmed today or if that will be for next week and then we'll just put the reading vlog up on Friday. We'll see as we go. But as I continue to do some work and driving and such throughout the day, I wanted to tell you what I'm currently in the middle of reading. Now on the last day of March, I did make it halfway through the Book of Mother by, I think it's Violaine Huseman, and I can't think of who it's translated by off the top of my head, but I believe it's translated from the French. And this was on my April TBR, but I needed a new book to start yesterday, so I decided to begin it early. And this is part of the long list for the International Booker Prize. And I'm having a wonderful time reading it so far. So it's kind of split up into three parts from what I can tell. I am listening to the audiobook for it, and it is, Following, it's very like stream of conscious. It's no conversations happening in the present time. It is somebody simply telling you stories. So it begins with one of the daughters telling us about her mother and they compare her downfall to like the fall of the wall in Berlin, I believe, as she is admitted to the hospital for psychiatric care and how that sort of left her and her sister without a mother and the hardships they had to face and a lot of the difficulties they had to face growing up with a mother, with the type of issues that she had. That was part one and then part two I'm on right now, we are focusing on the mother's backstory, her childhood growing up, her marriages and relationships and just the life that she's lived, her time as a dance teacher and a dancer and how she doesn't want to be a mother following abortions, how then she does want to be a mother and just all of the changes that she goes on throughout life. And I find it just extremely interesting. Now the writing feels very like stream of conscious to me. It is very just sentence after sentence after sentence. It feels like there's no break. And since I'm listening to the audiobook, I can't tell you like what the structure is formatted like. Um, so I, it was a bit jarring to listen to to begin with, but I've really settled into a groove. And I have to say I'm enjoying part two much more than part one. I really like learning about the mother's backstory more than the way that the first part was told by the perspective of the one daughter because I feel like we didn't really know the situation that much yet and we didn't really get any introduction to the characters since it's all tell and not show in that first part. Now I feel like in the second part we're really getting to know who the mother is and I'm hoping that the third part will sort of wrap it together um, because it says, it talks about how like the mother's first attempt at suicide was at seven years old. Now there are very graphic detailed things that happen in this when it comes to abortion, sexual assault, um, like child abuse. It is disturbing. It is very graphic. It is something that made my stomach really turn. Honestly, it was just very bluntly told, not gratuitous in any way, but I just wanted to throw that out there in case that's something you're sensitive to reading about, but 
I really am enjoying listening to the story of this mother and her two children and the experiences they have with one another, the mental health exploration, the commentary on motherhood and losing your sense of self and how you compare yourself to others, the romantic relationship aspects. So yeah, like I said, I like part two way more than part one. I do have less than half of the book less to, left to read. Actually, I think I only have about an hour left of listening time at 1.5 times speed. It is one hour. And so I should finish it today so I can give you a recap later on, but I'm really hoping in part three, we sort of connect it all back together and just see more of how the relationship evolved with her daughters. I almost want to go back and listen to the first part again, now that I have a better understanding of who the mother is, because I feel like I almost needed that before we were just thrown in the middle of everything. Everyone's pretty unlikable and it's pretty dark. It's very, very, um, tense and sad. And I don't know, this is, I feel like parts are a bit pretentious at times, but almost in a good way. So that's all I'm reading now. Lies. Hold on. Okay. This morning I actually started New Animal by Ella Baxter. So this is an Australian author, which is for reading around the world this year. And that's our prompt for April. And oh my God, I'm absolutely obsessed. A bunch of turned down pages already. So when I was walking on the treadmill and biking this morning, I made it to page 49, chapter six. We're following, what is her name? Amelia Aurelia. And she is a makeup artist for her like funeral service that her family owns. So she takes care of the bodies before they're presented at the funerals. And she sort of uses like sex and relationships as a coping mechanism. And it says on the synopsis, so it's not a spoiler, but I've just gotten to that part where her mother suddenly and unexpectedly dies. And I haven't moved past that point, so I have no idea how we're going to face that going forward. I just know that right now she's having to prepare another body for a funeral before her mother's takes place. And since they own the funeral home and the funeral business, they're kind of the ones in charge for that. We also meet her brother, Simon. He is in this they call it like a thruple. So I think there's another guy and a girl in their relationship. They're moving into the house. And then the um, stepdad, is his name Victor? Vincent. He's absolutely distraught. He's destroyed because how much he loved the mother. And then they need to tell their biological father, Jack. So there's a lot of aspects that affect this like family dynamic right now. And it's so interesting. The writing is absolutely beautiful. I love the writing. Um, I love the idea. I love the setup, the whole situation, the characters, everything so far is just so well done. And I'm so happy. I'm so happy to have picked something up and immediately latch onto it and enjoy what I'm reading. So this is only 184 pages and I really hope to get some reading time in this weekend. I generally don't read on the weekends when Paul is here, but since he's gonna be recovering from wisdom tooth surgery, I think that we'll have some like sitting around doing nothing time. So I do plan to read more of this. It's snowing. It just started snowing outside and I wanna vomit. It's April 1st and it's snowing in Michigan. Why do we live in this hellhole? Why does anyone live in Michigan? Why does anyone live in Michigan? I effing hate it. I belong in Arizona or Australia. <laughs> so yeah, Australia sounds great right about now, but that's this. And those are all the reading updates I have to begin this vlog and hopefully have a good weekend with lots of resting. I have postponed all plans. There are going to be no fun and exciting things, maybe some food, maybe some athletic clothing haul in this, but nothing wild because your girl needs to rest and recover. April 1st and this snow. Gotta love it.
Okay, a couple things. It's a bit later now, post gym. So I listened to the rest of the book of Mother while I was on my way to the gym and at the gym. And when I finished it, I immediately started the audiobook over again, just because I thought that I wanted the different perspective of the girls, the daughters, about their mother after learning about their mother. And so I'm still in the process of re-listening to that, but I already appreciate part one more now that I've listened to part two. And I think I understand why the author would wanna put them in the order that she did, but oh my God, I love this. I was very unsure at the beginning because it was so, first of all, the audiobook is narrated extremely quickly and I usually can listen to 1.5 times speed, no problem. 1.5 times speed on this was very fast for me. That is the speed at which I listened to it, but it was very, very fast compared to what I'm used to listening to. And so that mixed with the writing style that was just very quick and sentence after sentence after sentence. And I realize that sounds like nonsense because yes, that is in fact, Brittany, what makes a book a sentence after a sentence after a sentence. But you have to know what I mean. There's no like a variance in the cadence, I suppose, um, if we're relating it to biking here. I don't know if that's a proper word to use for writing or not. But after getting Catherine's perspective in part two, it just sort of, gave me a new perspective. It gave me a new, a shift in my mindset, I suppose. And I thought that it was just so heartbreaking and I could just feel Catherine like in my soul. Um, somebody who wants to live too fast and too loud and too large for what they're capable of. And it eventually leads to their downfall because that's not what human beings are made for. Um, and that is not what allows you to live a long life, but she loves hard and fierce. And um, she obviously has a lot of really terrible qualities about her too, especially in parenting. I mean, she should not be a mother. I think there are people that shouldn't be mothers. I don't think I should be a mother. I think that if you barely have the capability to take care of yourself, you should not try to also take care of children because they need you, they depend on you and they deserve to be brought up with love and care and tenderness and patience and kindness. And that's not what her children got. Her children had to fear for themselves at times, um, just even if it's just in the anger and response from her mother. And you understand why Catherine is the way she is because of her upbringing, because of the trauma with her mother and father. And it is heartbreaking, but I absolutely loved looking at this examination of motherhood, of the sibling relationship, of the mother-daughter dynamic um, between the main children and the mother and between the mother and her parents, of the mental health exploration and just, I don't know, I think it was quick and fast paced and it was exactly the length that it needed to be. I don't think it needed to be any more or less. I just think it was a beautiful short exploration, this snippet of these people's lives. And it was just an example of how motherhood can be and how growing up can be if this is your mother. I think it definitely focuses on the mother and I thought it would maybe focus on the children a bit more and it's definitely the mother's story. It is not really much of a story told from the perspective of what their lives were like. I mean, you do get that a little bit, but it's more so about the mother, even if the children are the ones narrating the story. I think it was beautiful the way that it all wrapped up and I wouldn't have chosen any other ending for it. So I think that I will definitely recommend this book for a long time to come to certain people. I think it's a little too harsh and in your face for some people, but if you like that mental health exploration and you like themes of motherhood, should I do a video about my favorite books exploring the themes of motherhood? Should I do that? Um, I wanna read the book Motherhood by Sheila Hetty before I do that, but um, yeah, I just, I really think it was great. I'm really, really glad I read it. I was very unsure when I started. I was quite doubtful when I started and it was well worth the read. And that means it's by far my favorite thing I've read from the International Booker long list so far. I've read Cursed Bunny by Bora Chung. I've read Heaven by Miko Kamakami. And I have read The Book of Mother 
by V. Lane Hussein. I think I'm getting her name wrong again. This is one I was originally like, okay, I'm listening to it through Scribd. Am I gonna be annoyed at spending $20 on the hardcover? And I'm certainly not. I'm excited to own it and I really want to recommend it to people. I'm not ready to leave that little, that moment yet of the Book of Mother. I don't know. I just think it was a great exploration of motherhood. I wanted to show you some book mail that came because it's kind of funny. So I ordered this classics edition. What are these called? I don't know what editions these are. Macmillan Collector's Library because this is my favorite cover. I didn't know. <laughs> this is Passing by Nella Larson. Here's the size of my hand. It's not even as big as my hand, right? It is not even as big as my hand. This is like a little pocket Bible in case you wanna like put it in your handbag and deliver it to your friends. I can hardly read this font. I don't think you understand. It is so small, but it's adorable and it's really pretty. Honestly, it's not something that I'll probably ever sit down and physically read again anyways. If I revisit it, it'll be the audiobook again just because I liked the narration and it was a story I like to consume that way. But would you believe this comes with a little tiny ribbon bookmark and it has gold sprayed edges and it is really, really beautiful. Um, yeah, so this is the edition that I got. It hurt, it hurt like hell, but it didn't matter if no one knew. This is Chicago. I feel like it must be. Um, but either way, I really, really recommend Passing by Nella Larson. Some other book mail that came, these were all from Book Depository that I'm really excited about. I think the only person I've heard speak about this is Jen Campbell, and it's just so beautiful. Supper Club by Lara Williams. I think this is a short story collection. It says, if you feed a starving woman, what will she grow into? Maybe it's not a short story collection. 29-year-old Roberta has spent her whole life hungry, so she invents Supper Club, a secret society for women who are sick of being told to talk less take less, be less. They, ga they gather after dark to feast and dance through the night, but as their bodies expand, so do their horizons, their desires, and their urge to break the rules. You look hungry, join the club. Doesn't that sound really, really good? Oh, okay, eat me. Eat me up like cream pudding. Take me in, take me, take. Anne Sexton, Anna who was mad. I like that intro. So we'll see, but a beautiful pink book to add to the collection. I love the blackberries on the cover. It's just like a little bit off-putting, right? And I love books that are like that. So that also came in the mail earlier this week and in the same package as Supper Club, I ordered this and that is a service by Frankie Mirren. It's a story about the sex industry that is groundbreaking for its complexity, warmth, and humor. I was seeing this on um, Bookstagram quite a lot. I loved the cover, so I looked it up and I heard some people giving it good reviews. Now it is quite long. It says, Lori works illegally in a rented flat in central London, living in fear of police raids, which could mean losing her small daughter and her dream of a new life. Freya is a student who finds she can make far more money as an escort than she could in an office. Life, after all, is already a tangle of madness and dissociation. And Paula is a journalist whose long-term campaign against prostitution has brought her some strange bedfellows. After a shock change to the law, with brothels being raided by authorities, lives across the country are fractured as a threat from Lori's past begins to catch up with her. The three women are increasingly, inevitably drawn into each other's orbit. It's a powerful and challenging novel about women's bodies, sex and relationships, mental health, entitlement, authenticity, privilege, and power, as shocking as any dystopia, but touching and deeply humane. Sounds wonderful to me. Um, these books actually look quite beautiful together, if I do say so myself. Seems like a bookstagram picture, but yeah, this is, I guess it's only 350 pages. Please tell me how it's that thick. I've read fantasy books that are like 700 pages that are that thick. Must be some thick pages, but, um, yeah, it just sounds very interesting and I've not really read a lot of books about like sex work or the sex industry. Um, so I wanted to give this a go. So hopefully these two will be read relatively soon. I'm about to make some lunch after the gym and waiting on um, Paul to get out of surgery. I just get nervous anytime anybody has any kind of anesthesia. And yeah, I like these spines too. I don't know why. Why am I addicted to book depository? Is anyone else? So I just wanted to update. I've been editing all day afternoon, man. All afternoon. You hear that laptop processing? Carly Kins is over here. I don't know. Alan Fox is over there somewhere. I do not know where the Rana Rana bear is. But um, we're just chilling. But yeah, before Paul gets here, I did just want to say 
that when I was doing some chores, cleaning the house, making some food today, I started sitting pretty and it is, wow, so far, very eye-opening. Um, it's unfortunate that it is eye-opening because that shows you, I don't I mean, I don't like to put myself down, but just things I was unaware of that I'm ashamed of, basically. I don't know, but you can only do what you can do until you can do better and then you do better. Um, but just the whole aspect of ableism and limiting people in like saying disabled bodies and disabled people and able-bodied people and how that doesn't make sense because we always are going through different periods of our life. Like you probably will have a disability of some sort one day, whether that just means you have a broken leg or I don't know, there's just so many different things that cause us to have a disability of some sort for a certain amount of time or when it comes to being elderly and growing old. So I love the whole conversation about that the most so far. That was probably, I don't know if that was the first chapter with her brother asking her why she wanted to write about what she's writing about. Um, and I just found it very, very informative. And I, I don't know, I'm glad that I'm reading it so far. And now I'm listening to the chapter about her getting married and then her finding um, her next love interest after the marriage doesn't work out. And it is an excellent audiobook narrated by the author, I'm pretty sure. And I just really, really am having a great time listening to it. I'm in my nonfiction mood. I just read two nonfiction memoirs. So another one, I love memoirs. I, I literally just absolutely love reading memoirs. So Carly can't get comfy. I'm about to watch Witcher 2 because of my excessive amounts of filming today. I think I filmed for well over two hours. Just, this isn't even a bunch of pre-filming. This is just how much filming stuff I have to get done for Patreon and YouTube. And so for that much filming and the amount of editing that I've done, my brain is fried and I can't sit here and read. Even though I wanna read more of New Animal, I cannot. So I read five books in five days. Actually, I read, I read six books in six days, technically, because I finished the Book of Mother. So I need a chill night and we're gonna watch Geralt of Rivia. Well, me, by we, I mean me. Paul hasn't seen season one yet, so. I'm not coming at you with my normal spirits because I am extremely sick again. I'm actually home from work today with a sick day. And I wanted to, so I apologize if this is quite nasally or if I have lots of coughing breaks. Um, but I did want to try to update you guys about the audiobook that I listened to with lots of breathing breaks in between. And I was mm, confused. I thought that March was Disability Awareness Month, but I guess April is actually like the Disability Readathon. And so it was perfect timing, I suppose, to read this. So I listened to the audiobook for Sitting Pretty by Rebecca Tosig. And this is a memoir. Um, it says, The View from My Ordinary Resilient Disabled Body. This was narrated by the author, and I just think that it was such an incredible audiobook to listen to. I recommend it to absolutely everyone. I think that there are so many good points. You can see how red my face is from being so sick and congested. Anyways, there are so many important points that she brings up. It is definitely like a very introductory, basic um, starting place for learning about some common like misconceptions or just trying to break stereotypes or 
things that can be harmful when it comes to terminology or how to help people. Um, I thought that this really brought so many things to my attention that I was not necessarily aware of in a way, especially when it comes to like reframing your mindset and helping people in the proper way. So the first conversation she had that really stood out to me was a conversation around able-bodied and disabled bodies and ableism and disability. Like just the terminology in general, how everyone at one point will probably have a disability of some point and bodies are not like concrete, stable in one form, they're fluid, you get an injury, you get an illness, you age, you change. And so it's a fluid thing and it can affect everyone. And so I thought that was like interesting to reframe the way that you think about it that way. Another thing that I thought was so important is just the conversations about how she, from her perspective, she didn't want somebody to specifically say, how can we help you and make your day better or easier? She more so wanted us to think, um, and just us in the world in general, how can we make things more accessible for more amounts of people and not require the help of others, but make it more accessible for people with certain disabilities to manage on their own. Um, so I don't know, there were so many important conversations. I learned a lot. I enjoyed hearing about her personal story as well and her life and just all of her experiences that she's been through. But I really, really thought there were so many great conversations in this and I think everyone should read this. I also think she really tried to go the extra mile to have it relate to people who might not have a disability um, because she brought up so many adaptions to different things we do that have benefited people without disabilities as well and how it can be helpful for everyone in reframing your mind and it was pretty sad some of the students in the classes that she taught who just thought but why should I care I don't think about you at all. I don't think about people with disabilities at all. I don't know anyone with a disability. It doesn't affect my day-to-day -day life. And while that's obviously very false in general, I'm sure that's a very common way of thinking. And if we could just help reframe people's mindset, I don't know, I just, I, I needed to read this. Like this tagline says, there aren't, there aren't words for how much the world needs this book. And that's so true. Um, I don't know, I, I just really liked the way that she wrote this book to be so digestible and easy to learn from. At the same time, made you think and evaluate like what you could possibly be doing differently. So I really enjoyed all the conversations. Another thing that I just wanted to point out, there was quite a, which is kind of, I don't know if narcissistic is the right word, but relating it back to my own life, there was a lot of discussion about disability in the workplace, even for females becoming a mother, maternity leave, or that time of the month, just different things and how it's absolutely preposterous that the workplace gives you, here's your four sick days. Um, so you can be sick exactly four times this year. And if you're not, we will shame you if you need more time off work than that. Um, so even how in 2022, mental health days are not something that people are given in the workplace. You get no grace, you get no forgiveness, you get no understanding that you're a human being because the workplace just wants you to be a robot and leave everything at the door. And for recently getting shamed for taking a day off work when I'm running out of my patient treatment rooms, coughing till I almost throw up, that just hit so close to home. And especially like she had so much to say about her father who worked himself to the ground, only took half a sick day in his entire life and was miserable for it and became a completely different person once he retired because of the stresses that our workplaces put on us and expect us, um, no matter what your body is capable of, um, to basically show up and be present unless you physically can't speak or can't put your clothes on is what she says. Like if I can't get dressed in the morning, 
there's a difference between, yes, I can go to work and I can do it, but I will pay the price later versus I know I need to stay home and rest and get better. And that will be better for me in the long run. So she just had a lot of great conversations about that as well and what disability can mean in such a wide range of ways. So I just, I also liked that portion of the conversation as well. So this is an audiobook I have since finished, since I spoke to you last. And then I will tell you too that I started listening to Disfigured. I'll put a little picture in because I don't own that book yet. But this is about um, disfigurement and fairy tales and the history. And it also goes into her own personal life and story of having cerebral palsy and what that looked like for her growing up. And we take a look at a lot of the history of fairy tales and how things are a metaphor for disfigurement and disability and how harmful certain things can be portrayed. So we're talking all the way back to like Hans Christian Andersen. We're talking about how Germans changed fairy tales about changelings, about Walt Disney, about so many things and so many fairy tales that I know growing up I had no idea could potentially be as harmful as they are in their representation. And um, this is something I have been interested in learning more about because I've read so much sci-fi and fantasy over the years and so many retellings and just being completely ignorant and unaware how harmful it is to actually portray I don't know, just certain things like villains with disfigurements, even as simple as like Scar from The Lion King or, you know, I was talk, I was watching some conversations and then I went to see the new Batman um, with always having the villains with disfigurement, just little conversations like that throughout, um, having your disfigurement or disability automatically resolved and that is the end goal that is the happily ever after. Both of these books talk about that, how I guess if you want to still use the word able-bodied people, I don't know what the proper terminology is. Let me know please in the comments if you know, like I can respectfully say it, but that so often they want to like completely remove any amount of disability or disfigurement and how that is not often how somebody with a disability feels. They're not necessarily looking for a cure and they don't want to believe that they're only happily ever after relies in them getting a cure for whatever ailment they might have. So I just think that there's a lot of great conversations in this book as well. I will say I like Sitting Pretty better than I like Disfigured. I just think keeps your attention a little bit more. Disfigured, I, I zone out a little bit at sometimes, and I didn't realize, which might be my fault going in, that Disfigured would be so much about her story versus uh, analytical look at the fairy tales, but she does sort of say that in the intro. So once I got into it, I knew that that would be the case. Um, so but I still recommend both of these books. I am almost finished with Disfigurement, so I don't think I'll have like too many more thoughts to let you guys know about um, once I do finish, but I will definitely let you know. Sorry again, this is so low energy. I do have a doctor's appointment very soon. So uh, it's just gonna be a Zoom call for now. I'm gonna just do nothing. I did nothing all weekend as I told you guys earlier and I had to work 12 hours yesterday and it was rough and I have done nothing today. And it's pretty early in the morning still. So I'm just gonna sit on my couch. I'm gonna try to let my brain zone out for a bit. I might work on entering some statistics into my spreadsheet. And depending on how tedious that is, I might do away with that because it honestly kind of causes me some stress and we don't need to have any stress in our reading. So those are the two audiobooks that I listened to. And then later on, I'll update you guys about New Animal because I actually did finish that on Sunday since Paul and I did nothing this weekend. And I'm freaking obsessed. And then I guess the last thing I'll say is that I've started Betty, which is a Patreon buddy read by Tiffany McDaniel. And so I do the spoiler vlogs for that. I'll update you on Betty a little bit and New Animal later on. Hello. So I'm feeling this much better and I wanted to update you guys. I realized that when I was talking about finishing New Animal by Ella Baxter that I don't even think I really mentioned what the book was about or any of my thoughts. I just briefly mentioned that I was reading it. So in this book, we're following Amelia Aurelia, who works for her family business at the funeral home. And she is the, I don't know the proper term, the makeup artist for applying makeup 
to make people presentable for viewings and the funeral and such. It says at the beginning in the synopsis, so it's not a spoiler, that her mom very suddenly dies and she goes to stay with her biological father for a bit in Tasmania. And in the beginning, she's in Australia. She leaves her stepdad, Vincent, her brother and his two partners, and Judy, the family friend who worked at the same place that they did. And she just kind of jets out of there because she needs to do her own thing. She's already dealing with the loss of a friend who took his own life by jumping off this place at the lookout that she goes to and she just kind of needs to flee everything. And she uses relationships as a coping mechanism, basically sex. She wants to like feel somebody's weight. She wants to become more than herself. Through an online connection that she makes one day, she ends up going to this BDSM club, having her first experience there, which I don't wanna get into any spoilers. So it definitely has a couple of scenes involving BDSM. This is something that I've never read about and I also don't know a lot about in general. So like can't really speak about that representation whatsoever, but I will just say from start to finish, I absolutely loved this book. I think a couple of the scenes were a bit more challenging to read or made me slightly uncomfortable because it's definitely something that I I don't have any interest in ever partaking in but in my opinion it's handled well because even if the main character had maybe a more negative experience she was never like looking down upon what other people were doing so it's a lot about grief and family and loss a lot of mental health processing emotions it was just so well done all of those are pages i've turned down the writing was absolutely breathtaking the plot was very cyclical from start to finish and oh man i need to find it i put some quotes on my instagram which i i tend to do frequently just in case you guys are curious but i loved this one my feelings which were shoved to the outer by the hot pain are once again running riot through my system therapy suddenly makes sense i could talk them out feel them trundle from my esophagus to my tongue until finally i could spit them onto the floor of a therapist's office or i could take drugs wrapping them up in a chemical blanket place little happy masks over their faces I could even birth them through my pores, through exercise, like Judy suggested, anything. I will try anything to get these feelings out. And then there's this other quote, it says, I am letting myself mourn and it is a fresh hell. Maybe like Leo, I should find another willing person to be my worry doll. Ask them to be the bag into which I can stuff all this feeling. So the prose is absolutely stunning throughout. I mean, like I cannot tell you how beyond impressed I was at this author's writing. This one was beautiful as well. I think about my mother's heart once being a conduit to my own and whether that means we are still connected. I think about Daniel's heart lying at the bottom of the ravine and whether his mother would have felt it there. Her own heart might have dropped the same moment as his did and she would have known right then that he had torn the cord between them. There's too much responsibility with being tethered to someone else. They are at the mercy of your own decisions. Anyway, my mother is gone now, so I don't need to think about her or me or anyone else, like Daniel and his mother. I don't need to be safe or responsible. I can hit the bottom of the ravine and she won't feel a thing. No one will feel a thing. I mean, are you guys as impressed as me? If anyone ever asks me how I dealt with this grief, I will tell them honestly, by killing the light of everything else around me. Anybody who's ever grieved or suffered can probably relate to some of these lines. Oh, I love this line, it says, it is as if the boxes I have used to compartmentalize have been tipped over, the contents strewn across the lobes of my brain. And I think that just says a lot about like how once you can kind of reach that tipping point, which I have sort of been in an experience like that lately, your emotions just feel so over the top, so hard to deal with, like everything that you've been boxing away and trying to keep yourself from thinking about and trying to make sure that it stayed in its neat little tiny places is strewn everywhere and everything is like these waves of just mess that overtake you. A couple more I want to read. This line I thought was so beautiful. How can I be full of moving blood yet feel completely inert? Just so simple but so breathtaking. I love this. Last one. Okay. I survey the land below while eating the rest of the mother berries. If I allowed myself, I would become untamed with grief. If it were socially acceptable and not frightening for everyone else, I would love to make a sacrifice or burn an effigy of my mother to carry her body on my back all the way down to the estuary where I could send her away with the current, sprint skin naked through the ravine, screaming. If I had the ability, I would turn into a huge malevolent demigod, a demonic goddess who would stand 10 tree lengths high, so tall that my head would reach the underside of the clouds. I would kneel in the sea as I clawed my fingers along the coastline, combing out all of the mothers from every family 
and sliding them in handfuls into the sea behind me. Because if I can't have a mother, no one can. That's the law of my land. Doesn't that break your heart too? So I will stop now, but I will just say this book will be hard to beat, like honestly for the years so far. It was brilliant. I don't know why it spoke to me so much, possibly her like mental health representation and grief um, and dealing with her own emotions, I found so relatable, but I thought it was absolutely brilliant. Like 10 out of 10, love this. Now I wanna update too and say that now I am on chapter 15, so page 168 of Betty. This is a Patreon buddy read, so like I said, I do a spoiler reading vlog for that, so I'm not gonna get into it here, but as well, this is fabulous. Like this is absolutely such a wonderful read. It is heartbreaking. It is disturbing. It is so very sad. It deals with um, racism and, and prejudice and the mother, the mother is white and the father is Cherokee. And so some of the girls look like the dad, some look like the mom. So there's already issues between the daughters and then going to school the oven is preheated. There is um, mental health problems that the mom is dealing with. There's just this innocent spirit that the children have. There's also this disturbing sense of like a curse and everything that could possibly go wrong. It's a dark, gritty feeling, very, very sad feeling book. There's one passage I really want to read. Oh, this is just a taste of the writing that I thought was beautiful. Jack-o'-lanterns on porches, quick to greet me with a smile and triangle eyes. Grocery store candy rustling in bags while crisp leaves blow past the rake of the old man too weary to pile them. A single purple scarf carried by the wind down a dirt lane and a crow of no name flying overhead. This is October to me, a conquering circle of autumnal shadows, ghosts, and mothers. And then some bad things take place in that chapter, but it is just a slow burn in the first section, part one, we go through quite a lot of time of learning about the parents. And then in um, part two, we're just more so following the children and their experience of things. So we've slowed the pace down a little bit, but once again, I think this will be a favorite of the month. Um, and these two books are just my vibe, my style of, writing, the prose, it's just all wonderful. And um, I'm so thankful to be reading things that I love right now in a time when like <laughs> life sucks and it's hard, hard to get day to day. So to be enjoying the books that I'm reading, there's definitely content warnings for both of these books, but they just really, really speak to me. They resonate with me. And this is why I read. Words are magic. Words can change a person. And I just, I don't know, it's just so lovely. Highly recommend them both. I did finish Disfigured this morning. I'll pop the picture in here again. And I will say, contrary to what I was saying in the last clip, it really improved a lot. And I like the second half a lot more than the first half, actually. I feel like I learned a bit more. I highly recommend both Sitting Pretty and Disfigured. And if you've read both of those and you have another nonfiction book about dis disability that you recommend that I read next, I would love your recommendations just because I'm very interested in trying to become more aware and educate myself. Man, I wish everybody would read these books. Everybody could get something out of it. Everybody needs to read these books, but I specifically did enjoy the look at fantasy and fairy tales and such and how disfigurement and disability plays a role in that and how harmful it is and just how ignorant, awful, certain things have been to the community. And I feel like both of these authors really spoke in a way that was accessible and understandable. And they really made a point as like a, here is how you can actually make a difference. And so I really appreciated the way that it was written there. And so when I start another audiobook, I'll update you guys then. Okay, I'm really excited. I did some meal prepping today. And so, well, I don't meal prep the cauliflower rice or the broccoli because kind of gets soggy reheated but I meal prepped roasted sweet potatoes in the oven like sauteed chickpeas with like onion and herb mrs dash and coconut aminos and then quinoa and then I'll show you it all assembled that's going to be the base I'm going to add these three things and then add spicy guacamole and garlic hummus and show you guys put together because sometimes you just don't want to cook everything the same day you know what I mean Okay, uh, I backed it down to a quarter cup of quinoa because it was too much for the bowl, but doesn't this look yummy? Plus, super healthy and a lot of protein, so I'm excited to eat it. Okay, friends, so it is later after the gym. I felt like I needed to try to sweat some of this out, and it was actually helpful to go, and now I'm just going to rest the rest of the night. 
hadn't been to the gym in a lot of days, so I wasn't coughing around other people. I'm waiting for my food to finish cooking, but I just wanted to update you. This is like the reading vlog of mother themed books. So I started One Italian Summer. Is that the name of it? I'll put the picture in because I can't think of the author's name right now. So this is a buddy read I planned to do with my sister because she read the other book by this author and really enjoyed it. And she thought I would enjoy this because it has a magical realism element. So I text her in the gym as I'm listening and I was like, dude, is this speculative? Is this magical realism? And she was like, yeah, that's why I thought you would like it. And I had no idea. And this also deals with a girl whose mother has died and she was supposed to take this trip to Italy with her mother that she purchased for her for her 60th birthday. She died of cancer and so obviously they're not able to go together and she tells her husband, hey, I wanna go by myself and still take this trip um, that my mom and I were supposed to go on and we need some time apart. I just started it today and I'm over halfway through it already at this point. It's a very short book and the audiobook reads very quickly. It is narrated by Lauren Graham. Um, and there's a Gilmore Girls quote at the beginning, which like I liked having the Gilmore Girls quote, but I actually don't love Lauren Graham's audiobook narration. My sister agreed with me. She's the one that brought it up first though. And I was like, no, I was totally thinking that. I did love Lauren Graham's narration for her book, Talking As Fast As I Can, just not quite so much for this one. It's very quick, very easy to listen to, very entertaining. The main character is pretty unlikable. I do not like her decisions at all and basically it's sort of triggering for me i most of you guys probably know have been divorced and when i got divorced the first time my ex-husband was like i'm gonna move out we need this time apart so i can find myself and that's sort of what she's doing when she goes to italy and like starts talking to this guy and i just think that's cruel and i just think that personally for me and like my relationships shouldn't be a thing, no offense for whatever you wanna do, but like, if you have to question whether you wanna stay married to somebody, no. You deserve somebody who wants to be married to you every single day, no matter what go they go through. Um, you should never, ever have to stay with somebody that had to wonder after however many years of marriage. It is super triggering to me. It makes me, oh, just furious. So. I won't give any spoilers right now. She ends up back with her husband after this. I will light this book on fire and hate her more than I do. But I do like the aspects that we're exploring in the mother-daughter relationship because she meets her mother in Italy, her mother in her 30s. And they spend time together. And the whole thing is like her mother is the, the love of her life, the true love of her life, not her husband. So interesting dynamic. I'm gonna eat my food now because it just got done, but I did want to update you that that's where I'm at with that. So on my little stand, I'm watching a Mercedes wrap up and this is my PBJ. Actually, the protein is strawberry cheesecake from Steel Nutrition. So once again, I blend a half a cup of oats in the food processor, teaspoon of baking soda, pinch of salt, little vanilla, then put in half a banana, one third cup of applesauce, and then the protein powder, put it all in the food processor till it's nice and smooth, put it in here and cook it in that air fryer for uh, 15 minutes. And then add one tablespoon of chocolate PB2 and sugar-free jelly, and then mix it all up. Oh, it's so good, it's so gooey inside. Okay, friends, before I go to the gym real quick, I just wanted to update that I have finished One Italian Summer and I hated it. Oh my God, I hated it. I don't think that it was like necessarily a bad book, but I just frankly do not stand for what this author was saying by this message of allowing yourself to cheat on your husband to realize that you love him and he's the one for you. I can't tell you how much I despise that. I despise people who do that. I just think there's absolutely no room in life for that. And so all of my all of my thoughts are the same as before. And I think the relationship she had with her mom was just a little bit strange. I didn't understand it. And as my sister pointed out, as we buddy read this, it's like she wasn't even grieving her mother. Like this book was not even about her grieving her mother, which I didn't really like. So I don't know. I just have lots of weird thoughts. I don't have a lot of coherent thoughts right now, but I think there was a lot of missed opportunity. Probably won't read from this author again. Definitely don't recommend this book, but it was very quick to listen to. 
Since then, I've DNF'd about five books. I started the final revival of Opal and Nev. Was so bored, I wanted to bash my skull against the wall. And so I decided I'm not gonna continue with it, at least for right now. Then I started A Very Nice Girl because I'm obsessed with this cover and I had a friend read it recently and enjoy it. And I got 30% of the way through it and realized I didn't care about one, her, her relationship, her friendships, or her career with singing and what she wanted to do. And so I was like, why are you gonna keep reading this? Spend $25 to own this book if you don't even care about the outcome and what happens. And then this morning I started Young Mungo and uh, I have a hard time with accents in audiobooks. So I need to start the book back over and slow it down to like one time speed rather than like 1.5 so I can get adjusted to the author's voice and narration because I, I really have a hard time with accents on audiobooks. So I'm hoping to slow it down and enjoy it a bit more, but I think I'm going to stick with Young Mungo right now just because I really am interested in the story and I've liked this author's work in the past and it's one that is just released. So I don't generally get to read a lot of new releases as soon as they come out. And the physical book I'm still reading is Betty by Tiffany McDaniel. It is one heartbreak after another. Like I, I can't even describe to you, it is one heartbreak after another. It is so beautifully written. I think handled with so much care and thought and everything about it is stunning. It's absolutely a five-star book if I was rating books. I like to use that phrase still, even if I'm not rating books. So I'm gonna head to the gym and then who knows, who knows what else I'll get up to today.